Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Ian is away. Tonight, stranded Canadians navigate confusing rules and narrow travel exemptions. So every time we FaceTime, she says, Daddy, I can't come home because the plane broke. Trying to get home before the holidays as Canadians here face rising case numbers. Another week, two weeks, it could be spreading very rapidly. Imagine undergoing a medical procedure only to find out your nurse is allegedly posing. So violating. I can't wrap my head around how something like that could happen here. After a woman is charged with fraud in Vancouver, patients speak out. An emotional homecoming in Merritt, BC. You can't, you can't describe it. Everything you've worked hard to accumulate is gone. We're there as people clean up and take stock. And the rush to replace thousands of stolen wreaths. We are resilient, and we are resilient because we help one another. Saving a holiday tribute to Canada's fallen veterans. This is The National. As the world tries to get ahead of the Omicron variant, the restrictions on travel from 10 African countries have left some Canadians stranded and confused. Getting tested and put in quarantine for up to two weeks, even with negative results, the journey back is arduous. It's a version of what most Canadian travelers will face soon as arrival testing ramps up at airports. And it comes with cases in Canada's two largest provinces already surging. We'll have more on that in a moment, but first, Travis Danraj has the struggle for some Canadians to get back home, despite new exemptions meant to help. Eugenie Vanderwalt is visiting family in South Africa she hasn't seen since COVID-19 hit. But now, she can't get home, stuck in Johannesburg with two small kids. We were literally probably two hours away from leaving for the airport. Um, when once we, then we started noticing, listen, it's probably not even worth going to the airport because they're not going to let us um, board the flight. Last night, Ottawa released narrow travel exemptions for Canadians in South Africa, briefly removing the requirement for a PCR test done in a third country so residents can return. But Vanderwalt is still stuck. She's been waiting for her permanent resident travel documents. Not a problem when she left for South Africa, but now she needs them to get back home, and the papers won't be processed in time. We're telling our daughter, who's three, um, you know, that the plane broke. So every time we FaceTime, you know, she says, Daddy, I can't come home because the plane broke. So, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. For some, the exemptions do mean a way home, but there are still questions about the requirements upon arrival. I will then do an arrival test. Um, I'd be kept in a uh, government facility until the result comes back negative. Where it gets murky is that I live in Kelowna, and so it's not clear if I will be permitted an onward flight then to self-isolate at home or if I will have to drive to, to get there, as has been the case under you know, other, other quarantine right. arrangements. Some of the requirements faced by travelers returning from parts of Africa will soon apply to travelers from any country except the U.S. On Rosemary Barton Live, the government said arrival tests at airports are ramping up. It could be days, I think, more likely days. Uh, in some specific airports, it might take a bit longer, but we are working very hard. Experts say vaccines are still likely effective against the variant. How effective will be clear in the coming weeks as Omicron inevitably crosses borders and spreads within them. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Ottawa. The health minister was also asked today whether the definition of fully vaccinated will change to require three rather than just two doses. Probably, uh, uh, almost certainly, because that's how uh, the history of vaccination uh, proceeds. You know, with vaccina vaccines have a limited uh, time during which they are fully effective, and that's going to be the case for the COVID-19 vaccines. Now, we're not there yet. Duclos emphasized that current booster campaigns are still expanding, but that eventually a proof of vaccination will require them. And he didn't rule out the possibility of annual coronavirus boosters, just like the flu shot. The call to get third doses into as many eligible Canadians as possible comes as two provincial hotspots, Ontario and Quebec, get even hotter. In Ontario, since the lows of late October, average daily new cases are up nearly 150 percent. If there's any good news, it's that the number of serious or critical COVID cases has barely budged. 
In Quebec, the case surge is similar. The hospitalizations for now also stable. As Talia Ricci explains, with holidays approaching, the hope is that any of those numbers don't get any higher. It's beginning to look a lot more like the holidays than it did at this time last year. It's nice that we can actually get together this year. So at least everybody's vaccinated. We still had like a night or two that we light candles. And uh, usually we have uh, Tim Hortons as uh, like donuts for Hanukkah. Christmas markets are bustling and holiday shoppers are lining up. But with COVID-19 cases rising in parts of the country, some are shifting their plans. We want to go to like international travels, but it seems like we're going to stay in the city. Ontario said it plans to stick with a provincial limit of 25 people for indoor get-togethers. But Sunday, the Ontario region Windsor-Essex dropped its limit to 10. Quebec's cap is also 10. However, the premier indicated he'd like to see it go up. His opposition criticized him for raising expectations as cases rise and we learn more about the Omicron variant. Is it spreading to a level that is threatening? Uh, at the moment, you know, perhaps not, but another week, two weeks, and around Christmas Day, you know, it could be, it could be spreading very rapidly. There are certainly steps we can do to make a safer indoor space, right? You can have vaccinated people, you can have better ventilation. Experts say for now, canceling Christmas isn't necessary, but being cautious is. And that also includes measures like getting a booster if you're eligible and considering rapid tests for your guests. Rapid tests, unfortunately, are not as widely available in Canada or as affordable in Canada as they should be, but they're also a very helpful tool. In these next 10 days, if you get your booster, you'll be well protected for the holiday season. While it might not be celebrations quite like 2019, for many, the return of scenes like this are enough to put them in the holiday spirit. I am so happy right now that I can see all the people are enjoying. Toronto is alive and yeah, I've been waiting for this. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. But here's the big picture. COVID-19 has delayed more than 300,000 surgeries in this country. Financial firm Deloitte says it will cost $1.3 billion to get surgery wait times back to pre-pandemic levels. And even if they're called non-urgent, they can mean everything to the patients. Karen Pauls begins in Manitoba, where pressure from COVID is taking a toll right now. Here's how urgent the problem is in Manitoba. Every single non-emergency cardiac surgery scheduled in Winnipeg this week is now on hold to make room in the ICU for COVID patients. It's unequivocal, it is clear, and it's undisputable that people are dying on the cardiac surgical wait list. There has to be accountability. It is no longer okay to say this is an unintended consequence of COVID. And it's not just heart surgery. 80-year-old Robert Lamont has been waiting two years for his second hip replacement. I feel as though I could go into a really deep depression. I'm fed up with it. It's not a, there's no hope in this horizon at all. The retired Manitoba farmer is used to being active, but now his wife Hazel says he can't even play with their six young grandchildren. He's gotten slower and slower and slower and because he's in pain. The Canadian Medical Association says nationally surgical backlogs could get even worse when the fourth wave is factored in. Its president wants action now. That tinkering around the corners of a system that's not functioning is not going to solve the issues. This is no time for cuts. During the federal election campaign, the Liberals promised a $6 billion investment to help provincial health systems eliminate wait lists. Manitoba says it's already put money towards the problem. We already committed $50 million to address the backlogs this year. The Premier is expected to announce a task force this week. To set a path for clearing surgical and diagnostic backlogs and to enhance our ICU capacity. Robert Lamont has been told he may get surgery in the spring. Until then, he holds on to this dream. Walking down and sitting on the bench and watch the river flow by. <laughs> Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. A shocking story from a Vancouver hospital now where after undergoing medical procedures, some women have received letters saying their nurse was allegedly posing in the job. And it's not the first time she's done it. Belpuri explains. 
It's been a year since Sasha Timku had surgery to have a polyp removed from her uterus. I was in a very compromising position. Obviously, I was very vulnerable and nervous. At BC Women's Hospital, she remembers a nurse who was loud and condescending and made her feel uncomfortable. I just had to say, it's okay. They, they do this all the time. These are professionals. Now it turns out that may not be so. Late last week, Timku got a disturbing letter from the hospital. The person who administered her pain medication wasn't a nurse. That person, allegedly Bridget Clarou, police say, was posing as a nurse. I felt pain, extreme pain from start to finish. Tim Q says the surgeon had to stop the procedure. CBC News has seen no evidence that Clarou is responsible for the severe pain Tim Q experienced. And Clarou has not been charged with any offences in connection to the direct treatment of patients, but she has been charged with fraud and personation with the intent to gain advantage. It's not the first time Clarou has had a run-in with the law. This summer, the 49-year-old was charged after she allegedly faked being a nurse in a medical and dental clinic in Ottawa. Over the last three decades, she's been convicted of fraud-related crimes in Quebec, Alberta and Florida. She's now in custody in Vancouver, awaiting a court appearance on Tuesday. The fact that this can even happen uh, raises questions around the controls from the health employers and uh, what is in place and is it enough? Obviously not. In a written statement, the hospital says, we can assure the public that we are reviewing this matter fully to determine how this occurred, any internal processes that may have contributed to it and impact to patients. Nice to meet you. Nice to you. Paige Morris got the same letter as Tim Q. The 25-year-old had a surgical abortion at BC Women's in May, a month before Clarou stopped working there. Especially because of why I was there, I can't, I can't, I can't grasp it. Like it's so violating, you know, like I just, I can't wrap my head around how something like that could happen here. The women fear how many dozens, even hundreds of other women may have been exposed to a fake. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. A startling admission today from the Department of National Defense about an expensive and important fleet of helicopters. It confirmed that nearly the entire maritime fleet of CH-148 Cyclone helicopters is undergoing repairs after cracks were found in their tails. That's 19 out of 23 aircraft confirmed to have that damage. It was first detected on one aircraft during routine maintenance last month. The issue has had some impact on flood relief operations in B.C. The Department of Defense says other assets filled the gap. Only today was the scope of this problem revealed. In British Columbia today, some important steps toward recovery for parts of the province devastated by flooding. The Trans Mountain Pipeline was restarted after a three-week precautionary shutdown. Highway 99 between Pemberton and Lillooet has also reopened for essential travel. That's where a mudslide killed five people in November. And while parts of the flood zone are bracing for snow tonight, officials say cooler temperatures may help floodwaters recede further. In some hard-hit communities, evacuation orders are lifting, allowing residents to take stock of the damage. In B.C.'s interior, the city of Merritt was evacuated suddenly as the floodwaters tore through, overwhelming the water and sewage system. As Katie Nicholson shows us, many residents returning face a difficult cleanup and an uncertain future. Ooh. Michelle and James Hintz tour what's left of their home. This is our living room. It's, uh... We had all original hardwood flooring in here. This is a actual hardwood floor in here. Mold and mildew cling to the sofa and to their bedroom furniture. The tub she used to relax in caked in backed up sewage. Look at my crisper drawers. After 17 days, a mess of decaying food and flood water. You can't, you can't describe it. You walk in there and everything, you see it in pictures, you see it on the news, you see it on TV and it's nothing until you can walk in and feel it. I know that everything you've worked hard to accumulate is gone. 366 homes remain on evacuation order in Merritt, and it's still unknown how many are salvageable, and the snow doesn't help. The streets are lined with damaged belongings, piled outside homes, clothes still inside a trashed washing machine. The torrent of flood water from the Coldwater River ripped this house in half. Inside, 
Plates wait to be unloaded from the dishwasher. This was uh, one of our streets. Uh, it's actually dropped down probably almost three feet um, as the asphalt and the, and the base was uh, washed away and it was washed all the way across the here. That asphalt now stacked in pieces. The river so violent it tore out one of the supports from beneath this bridge. The scale of the destruction is staggering. The job ahead, daunting. So now it's, it's, we take a look at the community and we say, like, how do we go, where do we go from here? How do we, how do we build back the community? What do we build? But for now, some are just trying to survive. The river rerouted itself around Bill Nash's home. His sewer access is cut off. In order to get to a porta potty, he has to run an obstacle course through downed power lines. I got to crawl uh, down the rocks here, slip and then sliding and then through the water, which isn't at least very high now. Boots are good enough, you know. And then I got to jump up that bank there and get through all that crap on the, on the ground there. Katie, you've been talking to people in the community. What are their biggest concerns right now? You know, a lot of renters were hit hard by this, and they're concerned about housing. This was already a crushed rental market. A lot of lit and fire evacuees moved here, and flood evacuees are worried that once those final evacuation orders are lifted and emergency money dries up, there will be nowhere left for them to live. Asha? Thanks, Katie. Katie Nicholson in Merritt, B.C. tonight. Rescue crews in Indonesia continue to search for survivors today after a volcano erupted on the island of East Java, killing at least 14 people. Video shot from a drone shows a landscape blanketed in volcanic ash and smoldering debris. Rescue efforts have been slowed by rain, which has mixed with ash to form thick mud, encasing homes and vehicles. The eruption yesterday caught thousands off guard. <laughs> Residents of nearby villages and towns were seen fleeing under giant clouds of ash. Officials say there's still a danger of further eruptions and they're warning people not to return to the area. The fugitive parents of the accused Michigan school shooter spent their first full day in custody. They were arrested Saturday on charges of involuntary manslaughter and the deaths of four students. As Katie Simpson tells us, their arrest raises questions about who can be held responsible in future tragedies. Friends and family comforted one another outside the visitation for 17-year-old Madison Baldwin, the first of the Michigan high school shooting victims to be laid to rest. While the community spent much of the weekend honoring the memories of these teenagers, on, police arrested the alleged gunman's parents, tracking them down in an abandoned art studio, charging them with involuntary manslaughter after they bought their son a gun as an early Christmas present. Out of an abundance of caution, uh, I have instructed our folks to treat them as if they're on suicide watch. The school board has announced an independent investigation into the school's actions. There were many warning signs that were not either not acted upon or not acted upon properly. This campus security expert says it appears police should have been called after staff noticed distressing behavior. Ethan Crumbly had been looking at ammunition on his phone while in class. Disturbing notes and drawings were later found at his desk. The school called his parents and tried to send him home after the notes were found, but his parents refused. He returned to class. That afternoon, the attack happened. If kids weren't able to get their hands on guns, we, we wouldn't have school shootings like we had this week. When parents and gun owners uh, fail to uphold this responsibility and tragedy results, there needs to be accountability like we're seeing here. U.S. lawmakers are once again being urged to reform gun laws. Maybe this shooting uh, will bring people back to the table. I wish my Republican colleagues didn't sort of have epiphanies on this issue only after mass school shootings. There is limited hope this may restart conversations about gun safety or start new ones about who can be held responsible. Though in this country, tragedy does not necessarily spark action. Katie Simpson, CBC News. Washington. 
We're learning more about what happened before CNN fired primetime host Chris Cuomo late yesterday. A lawyer says last week she contacted CNN with allegations of sexual misconduct against the popular host. The lawyer says her client is cooperating with CNN's internal investigation. All the network will say is it received additional information that led to the firing. Cuomo was already suspended and under investigation by CNN after the New York Attorney General revealed what he had been doing to help his brother, disgraced former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who faced a series of sexual misconduct allegations before stepping down earlier this year. Justin Bieber marching to his own step. Despite pressure that he boycott tonight's concert in Saudi Arabia, the Canadian pop star took the stage. The Saudi government has a long and recent record of human rights abuses. Critics say the country has been using celebrities and sporting events like this weekend's Formula One to distract from its repressive image. A Montreal musician gets banned from Facebook after being hacked. Now he's going public. The music scene is kind of like coming back and I just have no way of getting on that train. Coming up, why there's little help for small businesses caught up in a cyber attack. Plus. I think it's incredible. A hundred years ago, a woman was elected to parliament. The ceiling broken a century ago and the work done since. And. It's not Christmas till the tree's decorated. A PEI man is taking on Mariah Carey and her Christmas music reign by writing a song per week. Does he have a hit in the mix? At Christmas time. We'll be right back. For many small businesses, Facebook is a marketing lifeline. But what happens when it gets cut off? In this week's Go Public Story, Diane Buckner investigates what recourse a Montreal musician had after he got locked out of his account. Lucas Choi Zimbel and his band rehearse regularly in his living room, although he'd rather be earning money by performing for an audience. But that's become a challenge. Your account has been disabled. He uses Facebook to find bookings, but the social network deleted him. It's like the page doesn't exist anymore. After a symbol related to ISIS, the terrorist group suddenly appeared as his profile picture. If you're posting that kind of content, you will be banned from Facebook. And like rightfully so, it's just that in this case, I didn't post the stuff. So. He has no idea who did, Over but he's desperate to get his account restored. The music scene is kind of like coming back and I just have no way of getting on that train. Zimbal hasn't been able to contact Facebook to resolve the issue. The network has no customer service department for its 2.8 billion monthly users, many of whom depend on Facebook. It's an absolute lifeline for a lot of small businesses. This cybersecurity analyst says hacking is a criminal offense, but law enforcement may not help. Their intention is to find out who are the hackers behind it. He says with billions in profit, the company could afford to offer better service to small business owners. If Facebook is going to create a platform that people are going to leverage um, to, um, uh, for their businesses, for their day-to-day -day lives, there is a responsibility that comes with making these types of platforms. After hearing from Go Public, Facebook has now restored Zimbal's account. In a statement, it said, we encourage people to strengthen their security by turning on two-factor authentication and alerts for unrecognized logins. <laughs> Symbol is relieved, but he wants the social network to rethink how it handles hacks. I just think they need to do it in a way that doesn't affect individuals who depend on Facebook for their livelihood. He hopes to play for an audience again very soon. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Montreal. <laughs> If you have a story to share or a tip you'd like Go Public to look into, you can email them directly. Go public at cbc.ca. And that story is Diane Buckner's final contribution to CBC News. Diane is leaving us after three decades of impressive work and a long list of achievements. Canadian consumers have woken up and realized they've been paying too much for too long. Diane made her mark on the business beat, including hosting CBC's Venture, covering the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. 
and the big stories that shook Canadian business. You can get a very interesting perspective on the Briex affair from here, down under. And for 15 years... Success in the den requires a great pitch, a great product, and a great personality. She showed us how to handle dragons while continuing to report for CBC News. Tonight, we say thanks for all your contributions to The National and wish you all the best. What an amazing career. 100 years after the first woman was elected to the House of Commons, how many glass ceilings still exist? These are not easy doors to be first in, especially, uh, you know, colonial establishments. Coming up, the women who changed the face of politics in this country. Plus. There was that kick in the teeth, um, and it was really painful. Thousands of wreaths made to honour veterans stolen. How a group of volunteers scrambled to replace them. Stay with us. Welcome back. Tomorrow, this country marks a milestone. 100 years ago, Agnes McPhail changed Canadian politics forever when the small town teacher with big ideas became the first woman elected to Parliament. McPhail was not greeted warmly by some of her male colleagues, and in a story women know all too well, her strength was often reclassified as stubbornness. In the years since, some as aspects of her thinking and that of her contemporaries have come under deserved scrutiny. Notably, her support of the forced sterilization of people she believed shouldn't procreate, including people with disabilities and many Indigenous women. A century after McPhail's election, the pursuit of full equality and representation remains a challenge, and her historic election continues to inspire. Here's Hannah Thibodeau. Take a close look at this photo. It's the 14th Parliament, 1921. Now take a closer look. Does anyone stand out? I was elected in 1921 in spite of the fact that I was a woman. In the sea of men, Agnes McPhail, Canada's first female member in the House of Commons. I think it's incredible. A hundred years ago, a woman was elected to Parliament. It would kick off momentous changes in the corridors of power. She did a lot in Parliament for somebody who was a single voice at that time. Only three weeks in, McPhail stood in Parliament and pitched to change legislation to ensure greater equality. The sound of a woman's voice had never been heard in the House of Commons coming from the members' benches. And for some people, it just drove them crazy. But she didn't back down. Women don't want to be deemed to be part of the goods and chattel of men. Women want to be individuals, as men are individuals, McPhail said in that first speech. To stand there and to affirm that position that she took right off the bat, that she was there, she was there to stay, so I'll say thank you, thank you. And all of these women? Political trailblazers in their own right. Fast forward to 1993. Kim Campbell, 1800. Canada's first and only female prime minister. Kim Campbell says people still felt a shock to their system when she stepped into that role nearly 75 years later. They were not ready to revamp or deal with their own visceral reaction against having somebody who looked or sounded like me being prime minister. Mrs. Sheila Copps. When the Liberals took power, Sheila Copps was named the first female deputy prime minister. But Copps says her most memorable achievement happened earlier in 1987. When I first had my daughter, Danelle, she was literally the first child born to a woman in office uh, in the history of Canada. I breastfed her at committee meetings, and I basically generally drove the men crazy. Paving the way for other political women Ms. Gould. to help with work-life balance. Even today, Karina Gould was the first cabinet minister to have a child, but it's, it's still an anomaly, but it's not an impossibility. For some, there were additional challenges. When I said yes and I was elected and got to Ottawa, 
There were no breadcrumbs that were thrown by anyone that I can follow. In 1993, Jean Augustine became the first black female MP. Nine years later, she became the first black woman in cabinet. So I had to find my own path. I had to stand, as Agnes did, as a strong black woman, ensuring that African Canadians uh, were respected, that their issues were addressed. And she championed the adoption of Black History Month in Canada. For Indigenous women, the roadblocks have always been difficult to overcome. These are not easy doors to be first in, especially, uh, you know, colonial establishments. Indigenous women were not allowed to even vote until 1960. We were not allowed to leave the reserve until 1960. The Honourable Member for Western Arctic. I would like to thank my electorate for their support. It was 1988 when Ethel Blond and Andrew became the first Indigenous woman elected. I, Ethel Blond and Andrew. It took another 15 years before she also became the first Indigenous woman to sit in cabinet. I think is a testament and certainly a model for other people uh, to find their place in places that we were never supposed to be. Places that still can be hostile for some. I am an Indigenous woman and that clearly has made me a target of some very serious uh, harassment. But, you know, this is a tough business for anybody. For these women who have led the way and for those who have come after, there is determination but a belief there is a long way to go. I think to get there, you really need to have a thick skin because the bottom line is you're going into a man's world and not everybody wants you there. Populism is not good for girls. These are people who often want to go back to gender norms that were very, very repressive to women. Given winnable opportunities to be in winnable ridings, that we'll see more and more black females. We need more diversity uh, in politics. Uh, I will continue to push for that. And also to deal with systemic racism, even in this very institution that continues to exclude. In the last election, 103 women were elected, more than any other time in history. But that's only 30% of all MPs still a ways to go from what Agnes McPhail had envisioned. I don't want women chosen because they're women, but because they're competent persons, because they're human persons with ideas that are of use to the, to the people that uh, live around them or that they are going to represent. And even a hundred years on, the journey to achieve absolute equality continues. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. South of the border, people are mourning the death of a prominent American politician. Bob Dole overcame disabling war wounds to become one of the most powerful voices in U.S. politics. The former Republican senator has died at the age of 98. He was the kind of politician who's hard to find in Washington these days. Jim Ajuba, I used election promise from my opponent. A caustic wit, he was a master at forging compromise and shaping policies that would define many social programs. Through it all, he carried the mark of war. A shrapnel hit in 1945 left him without the use of his right arm. It wouldn't stop his devotion to serving his country. He would try to become president three times. But when he lost to Bill Clinton's re-election in 1996, Dole moved on with grace. On reflection, I think success and failure are not opposites. It's just part of your life. Today, the flags on Capitol Hill were lowered to half-staff in honor of Senator Robert Dole. Next on The National, we head to a mission with a life-changing program. Oh, it's delicious. And for the chef behind the project, it's personal. At the age of 14, uh, my mother told me I had to leave the house to move out. So that was a pretty traumatic time. How he's giving back, that's coming up. A brazen theft almost ruined a ceremony in Ottawa to honor Canada's fallen soldiers ahead of the holidays. Volunteers were stunned that someone had stolen thousands of wreaths they'd made for the occasion. But then they rolled up their sleeves and got to work. 
Valeria Corey Minocchio shows us what happened next. Hand-decorated wreaths dot the rows of gravestones at Ottawa's National Military Cemetery, commemorating fallen veterans at a difficult time of year for military families. Canada wouldn't be Canada without this. It's a touching holiday tribute organized by a charity called Wreaths Across Canada. The work never stops, so the military members are, are working constantly, and a lot of times they're away from home. But this commemoration almost didn't happen like this. The charity planned to lay 6,000 wreaths this afternoon, but last weekend nearly half were stolen from a shipping container about 75 kilometres southeast of Ottawa, a big blow to the small organization. It was that kick in the teeth. Um, and it was really painful. But Saturday, volunteers stepped up, picking up hot glue guns and decorations to make thousands of wreaths in just one day. So today, people could place more than 4,000 decorations in the cemetery. It's a testament to how the military community, both veterans, families, serving members um, and allies, really believe in um, being together and being connected and doing something. The Ontario Provincial Police are investigating. Meanwhile, Reeves Across Canada is asking the public's help to locate the stolen pieces. McCarthy says the organization will take more safety precautions going forward. Our C-CAN will be placed uh, hopefully uh, in a specific storage place um, or a military base or a unit base or even here where we have security. And it's a beautiful community to be part of because um, we are resilient and we are resilient because we help one another. A community moment that fits the season. Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal. The Ottawa Mission, the city's oldest and largest homeless shelter, feeds hundreds of people every day. Hot, nutritious meals for those who'd otherwise go hungry. But it also serves up something else, second chances. That's because the guy who runs the kitchen knows learning to cook can change a person's life, just like it saved his. Nick Purden explains. Thank you so much. It's perfect, thank you. thank you. If I could have anything that I could have, I would have that no one in the city goes hungry or in this country goes hungry. Because um, in Canada, we're in Canada, like it just, it shouldn't be this way. From this kitchen, part of the Ottawa Mission Shelter, Beauty. Chef Rick Watson feeds thousands of people in need every day. Nick, what time is the food truck coming down? And he says there's more demand than ever. Uh, it would be here before 10 o'clock. Okay. When COVID hit, our meal numbers just gradually just kept going up and up and up. Um, as of today, we're putting out 2,600 meals a day. Um, the pandemic has people, they can't afford to buy food. And, you know, so many people lost their jobs. So it's just the people are, are going hungry. And with the situation as bad as it is, Chef Rick knows that just feeding people isn't enough. Okay, we're going to start. Is that cool? Okay. And so the other thing he does here is to train people how to cook so they can find work and support themselves. Is everyone comfortable if I take my mask off? Yes. So, thank you. So today we're going to make a eggplant parm. To get into Chef Rick's cooking class, there's really only one specific requirement. Right. That you're in a tough spot in your life and you need help. They want to be self-sufficient. They don't want to have to count on social services or, or stand in line for, for a slice of bread. You know, they want to be able to support themselves and their families. Take Ernie McIntyre, for example. He's 57 with a wife and daughter. And when he was unable to find work during the pandemic, he tells me he got desperate. Man, I just sold dope drugs. Right. And that's right. it. That's all I did. I did that. And if I get goods and I can sell it to make some money, I do it. Um, whatever it took to get myself some money. We're going to put a little bit of the Parmesan on, okay? Then a friend told Ernie about Chef Rick's cooking class. Ernie, go find some milk, please. We're going to put some, some milk. Ernie applied, and for the last six months, he's been training nonstop. Now he has a job offer cooking at the Salvation Army. So this, to me, is, a, is like a light turned on, and I can uh, walk through a different kind of door. So that's why I'm so happy, because I know it's not far from home. It's just walking distance. So... Everything should be good in the next few months. There we go, there we go. Great. You're going to put another layer of sauce, okay? We show that we care. I, I've had people in my arms crying. Uh, we show we, compassion, forgiveness. I always say, 
I don't care about your past, I care about your future. When you cut the, the eggplant parm, you should see the layers in it, you know what I mean? And Chef Rick understands the kinds of struggles his students are going through because he's lived many of them himself. It's a, it's a very attractive dish. When I was growing up, my mother was mentally ill. Uh, she was paranoid schizophrenic, uh, so it was a very tough life. I remember at the age of around 10 years old, my, I was responsible for um, doing the grocery shopping for the house. And I could barely see over the cart going down the aisle. And then at the age of 14, uh, my mother told me I had to leave the house to move out. So that was a pretty traumatic time. It's going to look good, eh? Chef Rick couch surfed. As a teenager, he was homeless. He needed help to survive, and he found it in a kitchen Beauty. at Queen's University in Kingston. I remember sometimes I would sleep in the storeroom because I had nowhere to sleep. And then in the morning, um, you know, come out and just start working. And it felt like a home. And one of the people that worked there reached out to me and said, you know, you can do better. You could go, you can go to school. You could, you could be someone. And I, I never had anyone tell me that before. I think we can do the final layer now, OK? Chef Rick followed that advice and became a chef. First. And now he wants to be that voice for his students, like Casey Pink. She was a teenager when she got into drugs after her father died. I wasn't eating, so I was very emaciated, and just drugs was the most important thing to me. I really didn't have any friends. Um, I wasn't in touch with my family. It's when I hear Casey's story, I realize how much this kitchen can really help people. I don't want my daughter to go through what I went through. Hopefully, I'll be able to break the cycle for her, you know? But I care more about my daughter than I did about um, you know, the substances that I was addicted to, um, I'm able to be a positive role model for her, you know. It's just starting. I'm just starting now, but I'm making better choices, and if I, I can keep going with it and make her proud, you know. K Casey, do you want to come over here? And you're going to start to assemble, okay? Because of this course, Casey has found work cooking at the same shelter where she used to eat when she needed help. That's awesome. There we go. There we go. Ninety percent of students who graduate from Chef Rick's six-month class find jobs. Put that there. You got it. They leave here with all the certifications they need to work in a commercial kitchen. So you're enjoying your your, your new job? That's kind of an understatement. I'm in love with my new job. Are you? I'm yes. happy. I'm happy. It becomes like a family. It does. It? That's you right. just you love them. Yeah. I do. A lot of us that don't have family understand. Exactly. That. You know I mean? Exactly. <laughs> While these students finish their coursework and get set to graduate, there are others ready to start. You're liking it? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Good. With COVID, a growing number of people need a second chance, and that's what Chef Rick is all about. Kind of my first time growing this much chicken. Yeah, I bet you it is. This is your life's work. This is, this is your mission. Yes, absolutely. And it, it will be till the day that I, I die. Do we have some fresh basil? Yes. We're all the same when it comes down to it. We just want to be loved. We just need people to care about us, and we need to care about other people. It's, it's a simple process, really. It's good. Good. Nick Purden, CBC News, Ottawa. When we come back, meet a man who spent all of 2021 firmly feeling the Christmas spirit. Because it's not Christmas till the tree's decorated. Writing 52 Christmas songs in 52 weeks. That's next. When everything is right, we turn off all the lights. It's not Jingle Bells or Rudolph, but PEI musician Dave Atkinson is determined to get you singing a new Christmas classic. He spent the last year writing 52 original Christmas songs, one for every week. And tonight, his festive tunes are our moment. The lights are on the tree. The cards are all displayed. The original idea actually came a few years ago. I had heard and read enough about some of the origin, a lot of the songs that are like our classics, the ones that everybody knows and you kind of think are 300 years old, but they were actually written in probably about three years through the 1950s. So as a writer, that's sort of a beautiful thing, like to think about what if I was the person who wrote those things. On Christmas Day. 
I thought, wouldn't it be a hoot to just write a different Christmas song every, every week for a year, just to see if I could do it and thinking about what the special things are about Christmas. And I realized that, that what it is, is it, it reminds you, it, it gives you that nostalgic feeling. The box came from the basement. So I knew the content had to be uh, relatable. It's been a really neat thing for the year, a special thing. But to think that they're actually gonna be something I, I can perform for people, and maybe even some of those people can sing with me. Come on, that's wonderful. It's beautiful to me. It is wonderful. You know, some of his original songs include I Want Socks for Christmas and Colored Lights Look Like 1983, but in a good way. He's going to perform some of his tunes at a concert in PEI next week. It's called A Very Davy Christmas. And look, he hopes one of his songs, just one, will become a holiday hit. So best of luck to you, Dave. Happy holidays. That is The National for December 5th. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Good night.